Good morning. Good morning. We're in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates. Today's date is August 28th, 2001. And this morning we are pleased to have with us Charles Fagan. Charles Chuck, I think they call you. Right. Uh, very nice to see you. Nice Can we be begin here. by uh, asking you how old you are? I'm 77 years old. I was just 77 on the 8th of July you of this year. You just had your uh, birthday and your current address. Natick. And your marital status? We're married. And children? The four children. Grandchildren? Eight uh, grandchildren. Eight six, grandchildren. Six girls and two boys. That's, that's just wonderful. Where were you born? I was born in Brookline, Massachusetts. And raised there or no, I spent some been, time there? When a very young age, we moved to Newton. My, we moved to Newton and I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts. Tell us about growing up in Newton. What was it like when you got there? Well, it was kind of like a bedroom community to Boston. My father was a, was a doctor, and uh, he had his practice there in, in Boston, and he uh, wanted to, to get out of the city and, and move to Newton uh, in the 30s. Uh, I had a chance to, at a young age, I raised rabbits, and chickens and whatever, and get a little uh, egg root and whatever. Uh, I had a lot of facilities, playgrounds and tennis courts and whatever when I was growing up. And uh, we, of course, we all walked to school in those days. And I, uh, started out at Sacred Heart School in, in Newton Center. And, uh, I walked to school in the morning. It was probably uh, three or four miles. But uh, it was a great city to grow up in, and uh, I, I graduated from Newton High School in 1943. I, all through high school, I had, I had uh, part-time jobs and newspapers, delivering newspapers, and worked in the Newton Center Market, and uh, putting up orders in the basement there, and whatever. You said your father was a doctor. What about your mom? My mom was a was a great home homemaker, a great mother. Uh, she's a fabulous cook. Uh, and Baker, uh, I've tried to emulate her cooking through the years, and uh, and uh, I left the baking up to my brothers. They they were probably around more to watch that than I was. How many brothers and sisters? I have uh, I had uh, three brothers and one sister, uh, brother and sister older than I am, and two younger. As you grew up in Newton, and you're going to the public the schools there, to the school system, and you got into high school. Um, there's a war on now in Europe. Uh, did you guys feel a sense of uh, we're going to get involved, or did you talk about it? And what was your draft status? Um, in, in 1940, because uh, uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked, uh, the Germans were already over in Poland and attacked in the 38, 39. Um, there's an awful lot going on, and and we. Realized as a as a as freshman in the high school that uh, this is going to be something because the seniors in the, our class in a, at, at the school started enlisting and we couldn't wait. Uh, the biggest job I think that teachers had is to keeping us in school to finish our education uh, and that level. And uh, yes, I, we were one A for the draft. There's no question about that. Uh, several of us volunteered for a draft uh, in 1943. Uh, as I understood it, we wouldn't have had to go probably until the following March. But uh, so it was volunteered, and and uh, ironically, none of us wound up together. It's uh, we all went our separate ways. And Tell us about volunteering. Now, did you finish high school? We finished high school in June of 42. June of 40, 1943. 43. Yeah, and. Uh, did you guys say, well, we're all going down to the recruiting station and as a group? This, we, How we, many of the, you We went down to the draft board and said, we, we want to go right away. Yeah. And how did you decide on what branch of service you were going to join? Um, did you have any choice? Yes, oh yes. They gave us choice, uh, Army, Navy, Navy or Marines. And uh, uh, I think I, I chose the... I, I wasn't a very good swimmer, so I figured that the you know, Army would be the best bet in that, that point in time. Uh, my brother was already in the Marine Corps. Uh, he'd been in, he went in in 19, uh, uh, late 41 uh, in the Marine Corps, and uh, I chose the Army. 
And ironically, with my father being a doctor, I wound up in the medical corps. What about your pals? Uh, what what did they get into? Went the Air Force. They went uh, they went Navy, Marines. Uh, it's just uh, and they unfortunately a lot of them didn't come back. So. And in essence, uh, the war kind of split your group up. That's right. We went all different directions. You joined the army in June of 1943. Um, tell us about leaving home. What did your family think about this? Well, um, you know, as, as a parent myself, looking back on it, it must have been difficult for them. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure they were proud that we were, you know, we were going to do, do something in the war, war effort. Um, but uh, things were, you know, things happened so fast that uh, we were, we got out of high school and we were inducted in the, in the Army of the United States on the 23rd of, of June. Uh, report for active duty the 7th of July, and uh, and then we went. We went to. Uh, then their feeling was a lot of support, uh, and uh, and I think sad, worried. I mean, that was, uh, eventually there were four of us in service at the same time, so uh, that was difficult for my mother and father. I, I can imagine that was. Where were you sent? Uh, I was sent to uh, Camp Randall, Illinois. Um, this uh, is your first stop was in, in Illinois. This is. I went to Fort Devens. Okay. For in, in, you know in, in, the introduction of whatever uh, induction center. Um, they spent the first three or four days in KP. I issued the. I have an eight and a, eight and a half C shoe, and they eight. They mean nine E shoes to wear. And I broke them in at the KP. They were soaking wet for the first three or four days I was there. And uh, then they sent us to Camp Grand Illinois uh, without returning home again. At the induction center, um, did you go through a series of tests? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, there were a lot of tests. Um, it's, uh, I've forgotten all about that. And the inoculations, uh, tetanus, and all kinds of other things. Did you have any choice? As to uh, what you would do in the army, did, did you have any druthers that you would rather do this than that? Ironically, I I told the told the uh, officer the non-com that was uh, was interviewing me. I said, as long as I'm outdoors, I'll be fine. Now, that was the biggest mistake of my life because I never saw the inside of a building. Or I don't know when. Uh, I went to Camp Grand, Illinois, and and. Uh, it was Tent City. I lived out of a, a barracks bag and a foot locker. And, <clears throat> um, but uh, it, was, uh, it was quite an experience. It's, uh, now, why were you sent to Illinois? We went to, that was a, a camp, that was a medical basic camp, uh, Camp Grand Illinois. It was a, we took medical basic, uh, no, no arm, we didn't have, we were not armed. Uh, we went through the same kind of a nippery basic with you know crawling under live fire and all that stuff uh, in a combat situation, dragging a litter, if you will, and, and uh, <clears throat> uh, simulated uh, medical packs and stuff like that. So at, at Fort Devens, in a couple of days, it hadn't been decided you had a medical future. That's right. And they sent you and others like like you out to Illinois. That's right. Tell us about the kind of medical training you got, other than. Uh, Dragging litters through the snow, kind of. That thing. was about it. Uh, uh, they uh, they told us how to put tourniquets on, how to set up a broken leg, um, very fundamental things. Uh, how to give an injection of morphine and as an aid man, um, but uh, nothing more tactical than just to easing the wounded, uh, putting on bandages, pressure bandages, using sulfonilamides or sulfur, which is. The only thing available in those days, uh, there wasn't any penicillin, but uh, we had a lot of sulfur packs with us, and, and morphine and sulfur were the only thing for the morphine for the pain and sulfur for for preserving the the, uh, the individual. Uh, from what you've said, then you were never trained as an infantry person. That is, no, uh, somebody. How, how would you expect it to defend yourself? Well, that was the Geneva Conference, uh, and after World War. Uh, one uh, suggested to everyone that uh, if you wore a Red Cross brassard on your on your helmet, 
or your arm. Right, uh, nobody would shoot you. Nobody would shoot you, right. which was as a misnomer as could be, because uh, several of our people were through the uh, campaigns were shot right through the Red Cross, whether in the arm or the helmet or something. Uh, I didn't rely on that at all. Uh, not, none of us did, especially when we had in the combat. When you had uh, theoretically crawled out to a, a guy who's down and done what you could for him, bandages, morphine, whatever, what were you supposed to do with him then? Well, well we even... usually took, took his rifle or whatever and, and uh, turn it upside down and, uh, and we usually had plasma with us, we had to give him plasma so someone could see him, the litter bearers would come along and pick him up. That was not your job? No, no, no. And how long did this training go on? This, we were at 12 week basic. Do you feel that uh, at the end of 12 weeks you were prepared what the Army was asking you to do? Yes, I did. You got good training? Absolutely. Good officers? Excellent. Excellent non-coms, everything. It was a, the discipline was there. And what was your rank? I was a PVT. Uh, all of us were. Uh, uh, I was a squad leader uh, from the time I arrived and I did a lot of the drilling with, it, with, the, with my company and, and uh, stuff like that. And every place, it seemed every place I go is that you, yeah, I want you to do this, this, that. I was always a squad leader. I don't know why, because maybe a little taller than the rest of the guys or something, but that's what happened. Who, who was teaching you? Were these doctors? No, 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 these were enlisted men. These were non-coms, sergeants. And and teaching you medical things? Well, they were teaching them basic things, yes. Yep. I had more dignified training after, more specific training after this. It, uh, it, uh, Okay, that's 12 weeks you went in in June, so that's July, August, September. You're in September of 43 now, about yeah, that. Early September. And uh, you're leaving Illinois? Yes. Uh, several of us were selected for the AST program, the Armed, Armed Specialized Training Program, which would have sent us to college or someplace to you know, become a uh, more advanced <coughs> medical technology. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we were sent to Fort Harris, Indiana, and a Billings General Hospital, and uh, that was for basically for about an eight-week course, uh, and that's where we had a real concentration of, of medical training. As a matter of fact, when we got through that course, we could have taken, and they were told we could take on the course, <coughs> the exams for the Illinois, uh, Indiana uh, nurses uh, uh, license, and we learned how to do intravenous injections. We knew how to prepare people for the morgue. Uh, this is all when, you know, mine was 19 years old. Three months before this, we were, you know, kicking a football around or something. It was uh, or baseball, or throwing a baseball. This is very serious stuff. But this is really high tech, really. We were taking, giving each other injections. We showed how to clean a needle, sharpen a needle. In those days, they didn't have any throwaways. We had to take care of everything. Uh, how to use an autoclave, which was just sterilizing the instruments the doctors would be using. Um, and we learned basically, if need be, how to do traumatic amputations and without, you know, cauterizing and tying off blood vessels and stuff like that. We just, uh, it was really a, a really, really concentrated course. It, uh, and I loved it. At this point in your career, when you're doing this in, in uh Indiana, is this what you had thought it was going to be? I had the foggiest notion what I was going to be doing. I thought that maybe I would have stopped in basic training and been a litter bearer or, or an aid man or something like that. Uh, I had no idea that I would be in it. Did you, any, anywhere along, were, were you given a job description? This is what you'll be doing yes. when we get through with you? I was given a, a uh, my rate was an 861. I was a one as a surgical technician, and uh, that's really basically what I did, except for an occasion uh, in the combat situation. I was I was uh, I was on leave to one of the regiments to, to help okay. me with the depending on the amount of casualties we had. I, I don't, in any sense, mean to demean what you did and what you were trained for, but you're telling us that in seven eight. Ten weeks or so, you were trained from a, a kid kicking a football around 
to a surgical technician. That's right. That must qualified. have been very good training. Yes, it was excellent. Excellent. We had all doctors training us um, and nurses. Uh, we worked in the wards in the hospital, at Billings General Hospital, uh, taking care of the wounded, changing dressings. Um, it was a, it was a whole spectrum of people who the and they were from the venereal diseases right down to the to people who had come back from the states wounded. And, Any uh, guys in your group entities. that got this far and realized what was required of them that said, this is not for me? We had no choice, sir. I know there was no choice. I, not the, to my knowledge, everyone was uh, continued with it and graduated from the course. Yeah. Okay, what happened after Indiana? Well, we uh, one of our company commanders. Company commander was a was a lieutenant, a first lieutenant. He was from Newton, Massachusetts, and he took all the guys from Boston, well, actually over the hill, if you will. Uh, he got us all together. Uh, we went back to Boston from Indianapolis. Uh, we were home, I think, for four or five days, and uh, he called us all up and got us back in the to the train station, and we got, we got outside of the, the, uh, the base, and he put us all in columns of two, and he marched into the, and the, we got the MP stars, and where you guys been? We t told him. We were, we're all going overseas from there, so it didn't make any difference. Out so of they, Boston? He says, come on in. So yeah, we yeah. all marched back to our barracks, and three days later, we were on a train to uh, Shenango Valley, which is uh, outside of Port, uh, Fort, uh, it's the port of embarkation for Europe. And uh, Patrick Henry, uh, we were in Shenango Valley for about a week, stoking, we were all replacement depot then, we were stoking fires and stuff like that. And then we got into to Patrick Henry, which is the embarkation point. That's when I told you about the issuing those guns to guard the prisoners who were who didn't want to go overseas. Yeah, and, be uh, a little more specific as to where this is, Patrick Henry. This is in Virginia. In, okay, yeah. in Virginia. In, yeah. And in, now tell, tell us the incident again about uh, well, getting the Well, they issued a submarine, submachine gun. I found out after. I didn't know what it was. It was pretty heavy. And it had kind of holes around a barrel. And I said, what is this? And I, we were all talking, medics. And the sergeant came along and said, you guys won't go like that way. And we, were, we, got, we met as we were guarding. and. Uh, I said, what's this little thing here? Well, all of a sudden, this thing went off and went rrrr, and all the guys in the barracks we were guarding came out because we sprayed the, the barracks, and they wouldn't go back in those barracks as long as the medics were there with those guns. It was absolutely ludicrous to give us guns because we never, we had never trained in firearms, and we had no indication, no reason to. Even I, I think the people, the medics in the Pacific weren't able to get given any. Did they take them away from you? Oh yes, that was, <laughs> uh, was that was a good way to get out of that that duty. I'll tell you, we all went up in KP, but that's still us in the story. But you didn't police. you didn't hang around there long though. No, we were only there for a few days, and uh, we and you we, got on a ship. We got on a ship, uh, ship uh, U.S. General Man, uh, went out of Newport uh, News. Uh, I think it was probably. Late November, early December. I think we had Thanksgiving. As I remember that when we had, uh, we got on board ship. Uh, there were, I don't know how many, three or four, between three and five thousand troops, maybe. It's a pretty big uh, ship. It was a great. It was a big, big, big troop ship, and uh, it took us three weeks. We we didn't know where we were going. But we zigzagged all the way across the Atlantic, and we wound up in uh, in Casablanca, around in North Africa. Did you go by yourself? Part of a convoy, what? If we're all by ourselves. Okay, and you looked out one morning and there's nobody there, right? There's nobody there. And it's kind of it's empty feeling, isn't it? It sure is, yeah. and especially, uh, well, two weeks up, uh, we were just about a, well, four or five days I said, outside of uh, North Africa, and, uh, and they spotted a U boat, and a storm came up about the same time, and the storm was really rough. We lost a an anchor off the front of the bow of the boat and the ship, and, and it buckled all the plates, so the, the, we got a lot of leakage. And uh, the captain said, "This uh, there's a U-boat out there, and blah, blah, uh, and uh, we'll do the best we can." So uh, we finally made it back into uh, we made it into to Casablanca and stayed there for four or five days, and then we got on a 
boxcars. Hold it there a second. Uh, at any point along the way, did they tell you where you were going? No. So you looked out one morning and you see this the water, coast of water, Africa. All around us. And, but then you see the coast of Africa. Did they finally say this is Africa? This no, we didn't know it until we got on. We said, where are we? And Casablanca. Yeah, Casablanca. Well, by the way, on board ship, I was going over. We ate twice a day. We landed up first thing in the morning, and then when they found that that line got through, we were back in line for dinner at night. Was, uh, that many guys on board. Well, yeah. a lot of guys on board. And uh, I was fortunate, a friend of mine, this kid that was with us, he said, he was on board ship, he started to throw up. He got seasick right away. And he had the top bunk, and I said, Val, I want that top bunk. You can have the bottom one when you throw up. Exactly. I don't want to be down there. Yeah, there's and, such a thing called gravity. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I think it was five or maybe six or seven tier high with all these bunks, toe to toe. It was really cramped. cramped. With, with all these guys on board ship, were you part of a unit? Yet. No, we're all replacement people. Okay, so you, you we're, were going to go to a depot we somewhere were, and become we part the, of a unit. We were going to be the fodder for the next round. Tell us about getting off the ship and where you went from there. Well, it's, it's got a lot of us time to, to get our, seat, our land legs back because we were on board ship for so long. Uh, and uh, we, uh, I guess it just let us rest there for a while. We didn't do anything, no, no training or anything. They gave us... Uh, uh, tent stakes as the walking guard to, uh, around the perimeter of Arab, or, or for, uh, we were stationed and bivouacked. Um, it was interesting, we saw a few of the natives there with, with barracks bags and with holes cut in the bottoms and then the, and the, the tie waist and these guys had, the, you could see some, some army guy had his, his name across this guy's butt with his serial number on it, which was kind of humorous. but. Uh, it, but we were only there a few days, then we got on these, and we had to sleep toe to toe, uh, a toe to head rather, on these uh, 48 eights. And then we went to Oran, and for Oran we stayed there a few days. And uh, at this point in time, we didn't dare take our packs off. Every time we took our backpacks off, we were told to move someplace, we had to gear up again. So uh, we were only there a couple of days when we got on a, on a, uh, a Dutch freighter, uh, manned by the British. And uh, we could, and now Tarantino you went, you've got on a British ship that's manned by the British, you're going to get kidneys one way or the other. And uh, we had kidney stew and kidney this, kidney that. That it was, the, the conditions on the, on the ship were tragic. They were just. Uh, did did you know where you were going? Way. Pardon? Did they did tell you where you were going? No. no. We were told we were supposed to go into Sicily, but that didn't happen. We went up in Naples. You went to Naples out of Iran? Yep. And uh, were you still yet part of a unit? No, no. no. We were all replaced. We went to the replacement depot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We went to Naples, and Naples they trucked us in to a place called Caserta, which is in the Rapido Valley. Uh, the Rapido River ride runs through there. It's raining, cats and dogs, it's cold. Uh, and this is, is this is January 44 or something like this that? This is late, late December. Late, late December. December. What was going on in the war at that time? Where, well, where we, were, were things? we were just below Casino, and and they we tr they took several of us, and they tried to get us up to Casino to relieve the medics up there, to replace the medics up there. And the Germans had ADH covered all around us, so and that's, that was an anti anti personnel. And it was an artillery shell, and they used it as an anti anti personnel weapon. We couldn't make it, so they brought us back, and uh, the sergeants told us, okay. Uh, you guys take all your personal belongings with you because you're not coming back for anything else. And I said, where are we going? So we're going to Anzio. Well, Anzio had been, they had a landing in Anzio, uh, I guess about mid-January. Uh, and here it was probably, I don't know, a week later. And uh, that's what we wanted. You were to. sent there, so you're joining Mark Clark. I was joining the 5th Army, I was 3rd Infantry Division, because okay. I was assigned the 3rd Medical Battalion. And uh, that's when we saw our first combat. It's, uh, we were there for over four months, four and a half months. And the Germans ricocheted, they checkerboard that thing every single morning. Tell us about, this, this is your first in, uh, yeah. introduction to combat. Tell yeah. us about that, if you would. Well, uh, we didn't, well, we got off the ship, the, the commander of the, of the LST we were on said, 
get your butts off this thing because I'm going to start backing off right away. So we got off as hurry as we could, and he said, in, in the, the non com in charge of us, said, keep close to the buildings. And because and there were rounds coming in uh, for, to the harbor there. Uh, they were trying to get blow up the LSTs and any, any ammunition. Was this at Anzio? That was an Anzio. An All right, thank you. And uh, we finally went up to our, where, I, where we were assigned, and I could see nothing but flat sand and a couple of oval tents that, that were level over the ground and uh, with red crosses on them. And these were the surgical tents with, for, the, for the guys who were coming in from, from the being wounded and shot and whatever, uh, amputees and whatever. And that was a, we, that was when I, my job with them was a surgical technician, technician is to work with these people uh, and uh, uh, get them prepared for evacuation. We used to do a lot of evacuating at night. Do you remember your first patient? Uh, the first guy no, you treated? No, but I almost gave him a patient. So I said, what's the Russian in digging the, digging the foxhole here? And with that, a round came in, and I got a piece of it right on my hip, and it knocked me on my butt. And I said, whoa, we. <laughs> I dug two holes before I found the, it got a hole that didn't fill up with water. And uh, so that was uh, our indoctrination. I don't remember the first one, no, so I don't. You were wounded the first? No, it was, it was hit me flat on the hip as a piece of, of shrapnel go like that. And it just hit me right. It, it's, uh, I don't know what it hit, but it, it hit me on my hip. It, it was, a, you know, it was, a, it was a, it smarter for a couple Well, you were lucky. I yeah. was very fortunate. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I was, but uh, <laughs> that was a matter of debate later on in the campaign. But uh, Tell us specifically what you did. Um, with the wounded. Yes, uh, you see, this is a this is D Company, which is a sort of a clearing company. Uh, the the A, B, and C uh, companies covered each one of those companies covered the div uh, regiment. We had the the Third Infantry Division was a was a triangle division of fifteen thousand people, and uh, we had the Seventh, the Fifteenth, and Thirtieth Infantry Regiments, and. Uh, uh, the A, B, and C companies were with them as aid people and, and pulling, and pulling the people back and putting them on ambulances or just bringing them into us uh, in the clearing company. And uh, our job was to uh, make everyone comfortable, make sure the wounds were, were bleeding and stopped, make sure we had given them penicillin when they needed it, give them morphine when they needed it. Uh, it's uh, the, one of the things that really, uh, oh boy. Uh, uh, impressed me so much with it. All these kids are all, all about my age, uh, going for their mothers. You, you are not uh, in a hospital situation here. I'm, I'm trying to. No, no. It was I'm trying not, to was get to very, what was going on around you. What were there? Well, the people were coming in, being and, treated, and sent out right away. And how about artillery fire? Oh, uh, yeah, we were getting, we got artillery fire all around Planes us. over your head, bombs, strafing, oh, we, we any of The only this? place in that beachhead without wearing our helmets, and I, I, if I, I wish I could have saved my helmet because they took it away from us at Devon's putting it out, but my head, helmet had more dents in it from the anti-aircraft fire, of course, it was, it was just all over us all the time uh, on the NGO. It's, uh, and, of course, as I said, the, the Germans just check aboard that Beach had every 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 day all day long, and the ground just never stopped shaking. The Americans had enormous problem getting inland to establish a foothold. Every so time you guys are literally on the beach, aren't you? That's right. Yeah, we were we were less than a mile in, and we were seven miles long. Um, it's uh, it was just uh, most of the stuff was less than a less than a mile, maybe a half mile, with the Mussolini Canal running across. But uh, we couldn't build up any ammunition. Uh, to, to, to if we get off that beachhead, we're going to need a lot of of, uh, of uh, artillery power. You're going to need a lot of, of ammunition, and every time, it's once in a while, they had a, a three five five howitzer up above Rome, and they used to throw that into our beachhead in the in the in the harbor. One night they caught caught a, an ammunition ship there, and uh, anything that was above ground on Anzio was flattened. But uh, you know it's. Uh, the Germans had a mortar that could fire from. They had an artillery piece, a railroad uh, gun. North of oh, a one of the big gun. berthas. They call it yeah. Yeah, uh, firing from north of Rome up to Anzio. Yeah. What's the distance there? Oh God, 
probably uh, three or four miles, five miles, maybe more. And it was but effective. We could hear it. You could hear it yeah. coming. And it was right on the harbor. It was a 350 odd millimeter. Well, that's like a shooting a Volkswagen at. It's about, about the size of it. Yeah. Yeah. How long did this go on for you? Over four months. And the casualties there were, were, uh, were atrocious. I had the opportunity to go back uh, after the war, uh, and 25 years ago maybe. Uh, and you could see the crosses there in the turn over the, in the graveyard just. Uh, you went back 20, uh, 25 years ago? Yeah, yeah. And I saw all these crosses, and just uh, unbelievable. The, uh, as far as you can see, in any direction. Yeah. It's like Normandy. It goes yeah, on, I suppose Normandy goes on forever. Way, but, uh, were you? Uh, do you feel, in, in retrospect, that you were really equipped for your job? That you feel good about your the way you performed and your unit did? I absolutely do. Yes, I think that uh, with our training, with the office that we had, that the, the medical personnel, uh, these these soldiers got the best possible care they could possibly get. Uh, caring, uh, it was just a minute care, if you will. Uh, we did the best we can. Some of these people had abdominal wounds, wounds and chest wounds, and their faces blown apart. Uh, you know, it was just a it was constant. It was, it was just like a mirage. The whole thing was constant doing something, and you almost did everything automatically. It's, it's, uh, you must have had to make some pretty quick decisions. We had to. Uh, we were had you to. part of triage? Was this no, it one of your like functions? That. No, no. We were on our own mostly. It's, uh, we had these people come in, and, and we, if you can imagine a couple of SEMA trunks, they put the litters on them. We must have had oh, four or five of them at home. We were operating on these people yeah. all the time, it's, uh, trying to get them comfortable so we could. Get them back to, to Naples to back hospitals. That's so that's my next question. Yeah. Uh, they couldn't stay there. Where where were they shipped to? They were back, shipped back out to Naples. Until we started to move off the Angel, they shipped them back to Naples from the, on, on these LSTs that brought us up. They were taking them back. Yeah, and uh, that was a that was a, that, that probably the biggest mistake that that that, uh, that happened in the in, in the Italian campaign uh, with Anzio. What they thought they might do was to sneak around the casino. Because the casino was so, so high, nobody could get near it. And they had artillery powder up there that you wouldn't believe. So that when we got under Anzio, they threw a couple of uh, Panzer divisions at us, and that was it. We didn't get any very far at all. There were three divisions there. We had the 36th, the 45th, and the 3rd Infantry Divisions. And uh, spread around that beachhead, so you can look high. It was a highly concentrated. Uh, Firepower we had, but they couldn't move. They had the high ground above us, and because yeah, the sister they, and they surely did uh, to the extent that they uh, finally had to bomb everything on top of the uh, the mountain. Right. Going back and reading about all that you went through from a vantage point of 50 years later, uh, do you look at Mark Clark and do you look at strategy and do you look at how? Um, we might have done something better than invade the at Anzio. No, I don't. I don't think any of us do either, because uh, that was done was done. There's no way you're living it, and uh, I guess that's why I, I've never talked about this before. Uh, this is a, really the first time that anyone's asked me any questions about it specifically. Uh, but no, I, I would, I would, I never doubted strategy. You know, that everything happened so fast. In, in, in a combat situation in wartime, that uh, you're not pointing fingers at it, anyone. Uh, I never had the occasion to say this guy was responsible for this guy's death. No, I couldn't. Uh, and I suppose while you're going through it, you're you're trying to do your job as as well as you that's can, all you can and do. to survive. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's like Brokaw said in his book. You know, I, we all did our thing, and. Uh, Get back to campaign back home, and specifically, that's you know, forget about it. This is another page in history now. 
in four months, uh, were you relieved, or did you? No. Uh, what what happened after the four months? Well, we we got a lot of fire, air power one morning, bright and clear. It was before it was bright and clear. We had uh, bombers, B-24s, I think they were, came over almost wingtip to wingtip, wingtip bombing, and strafing, all, and fire planes strafing, all the way up to to just outside of Valmontone. And it was absolutely amazing. And we, we the might empowered us to, we had tanks hidden. We were able to start moving up the highway to, to Rome. And uh, it was a, it was quite an experience. It, it was almost like leaving home again because that foxhole had been up for four and a half months. It looked pretty good. And it all re, reinforced on top and whatever. But uh, here we are on the open again. And, and uh, it was a good feeling, and uh, until we called for some, from air power strikes from a fire outfit, and, and we were between Sister and Corey, and uh, they came up, and we had all our vehicles had white circles with a star, a white star, star in the middle of it, and we called this firepower up because the Germans were the other side of Corey going up to Valmontone in Rome, they were backing up, and we wanted to, you know, nail them there, unfortunately. They strafed us between Sister and Corey, and never touched the Germans at all. And they went that, that fighter, those fighter planes strafed and bombed us. Uh, you were strafed by, by yeah, I have Yep, yep. I, we, our unit was not on the road yet, thank God. And uh, some of the artillery people and, and uh, engineers and infantry people were, were, were killed. And that's when uh, they had a bypass around Sister. We evacuated people that afternoon uh, through the evening and at 2 o'clock in the morning I was coming back uh, on a six by uh, that big army trucks, uh, two and a half ton trucks. We couldn't get the Hammersons went geared for only two or three, maybe four litters at most. And we were able to get 12 or 15 of people on these. And uh, going back from, from uh, Anzio, uh, one of the trips, uh, that's when I get hit. And. Uh, German plane came over and dropped a bomb on us. It dropped a flare and then the bomb landed. Uh, I was in the right front wheel of the truck and, a, and there was a minefield to the right of me. And, uh, the bomb landed, I guess, in the left front wheel of the truck and that was the last I, I knew for a couple of weeks. I'm sorry, I guess I jumped ahead of you. That's okay. Let's do but it I, in that your was sequence. A, that was uh, something that... Uh, you were... Uh, Bombed by a German. A German, yeah. It's a 500-pound bomb, as near as they could tell, because the truck was disintegrated, and I wound up in the minefield. And these two guys I was in line on top of, the driver and his assistant, uh, managed to drag me out of the minefield and took me to the aid station, which was just. And uh, it was then the buddy of mine came along, and told me after. He said, I came along, and I went to the OD, and he said. Captain, there's a Fagans out there in a pile of cadavers. And he said, yeah, yeah, I know. He said, well, he's moaning. He said, bring him back in here. So they, they brought me back in, and I guess I went to a field hospital there somewhere. And I, they gave me plasma and whatever. And I had a wound in my leg, and I was bleeding from my eyes, I meant from my nose and my throat, and uh, from the concussion. But I was, and people 100 yards away were killed from the concussion. I was like, apparently inside it, I don't know. To this day, I'll never know how I survived that. Were you, uh, after the, uh, the bomb struck, you were it, then still in a minefield? I was just the right front wheel of the truck when it hit, but I wound, I was thrown into a minefield. It said mine, whether there were mines there is this question, but uh, nobody was going to find out. I, we, I wasn't about to run into that. But field. somebody came and got you. And there's two, the guys I was lying on top of, the driver and his assistant, who was, I, I was in the cab of the truck with them. Yeah. And when it stopped, and he jumped, they, they jumped out, and I jumped on top of them. And they, they were fine. You woke up, you say, two weeks later. Well, I knew what was going on, I think, maybe 10 days to two weeks later. I, I saw that ring in my ears, and, and uh, I was anxious to get back to my outfit. Uh, Where were you? I, well, I was in a I was in a field hospital as I can as I can remember, and uh, which moved along with just behind us uh, on the way to Rome, and that maybe it was uh, that was in May, some part of 
of June, uh, I jo rejoined my outfit in Rome. And uh, we garrisoned in Rome for about two or three weeks. Uh, and we bivouacked in the, in the uh, Mussolini Stadium, which was an athletic stadium they had near the Tiber River. And uh, I guess I was rehabilitated enough to get back to the outfit. And we were more than a rest there because there was no, we weren't suffering any casualties of our, of our division. And uh, actually, after that, we, uh, uh, we, had, we toured the city. Uh, we had a general audience with the Pope. And, and then we, were, we went back to, we were on the move again to Naples. Uh, where are we going now? Nobody would tell us where we were going because we went down there and uh, the, in the award ceremonies they gave all the bronze stars and, and purple hearts and silver stars and, and uh, see him it's going to be wrestling men of honor some of these people who'd, who'd won it in the Italian campaign and we were training for another landing and this was going to be on the 15th of August 1944. So somewhere in here was D-Day that was that was D-Day in Normandy. Yeah. That was in uh, I think it was in May. Uh, it was a June June I guess it was in Normandy. Yeah. So you you were in Rome when that happened. And that was we were in Rome. And they sent and you we south to Naples. We, we down, yeah, we went down to Naples late June early July, and uh, we were training then for actually what we were doing was just <coughs> getting ready for an invasion. That's getting all the trucks cosmoleaned and ready for. Just going in the water and stuff like that. Now, this, did this time did they have the good grace to tell you where you were going? No, you you just uh, training for another invasion. Blind faith. The, the, we had, we, we the, didn't do much the, about it anyway. Send us to a nice place. And they know <laughs> silence is golden and a lip, a slip of a lip could sink a ship or something like that. Maybe that was the theory. But we were on LSTs and we pulled out one morning uh, and. Uh, and that, about the, maybe 10th, 11th, 12th of August. I can remember in the Higgins boat, uh, Chamberlain came by with a cigar in his mouth and his hand waving like this. Who did? Uh, not Chamberlain, but uh, Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill came out and was waving to us with a big cigar. Really? You saw him? Yeah, yeah, he came by the LST. He came by the whole, the whole line of LSTs going up to the... And you were on your way now to the uh, coast of France, I think. That's right. We went up to Saint Tropez. Saint Tropez, August fifteenth, nineteen forty-four. Yep. And I said, "You're gonna, you won't have to, you know, you won't do anything else. You just take it easy." I sure. I was there eight plus eight minutes, I think, going into the beach, and, and uh, that was a, that was a. I mean, uh, not much is ever said about it. You read the papers on the fifteenth of August. Nobody ever says anything about the land in southern France. We lost a lot of the people there, and uh, matter of fact. The Higgins boat I was in um, was heading for a spot on the beach, and this guy came out of the coxman. And the other Higgins boat came from our right and went right on the spot where we were going, and boom, he had a landmine, and uh, all you could see was helmets and boots and rifles, and that was a. Uh, and of course, with that hot guy went right on top of him, and uh, we got our feet wet when that made up the beach here. Looking back at the beach, all we could see were gas masks on one end of the beach to the other. Everybody abandoned them. Yeah, yeah. Was, you know, there's no gas, there's no gas masks. Yeah, that's right, that's yeah. what we hoped, anyway. Tell us, back up just a second. You're in a Higgins boat going ashore to an invasion of continental Europe. What's it like to look at either side or in back or over your head? What did you see? Um, I guess really, uh, what I should start with is when the LST were on, because they had a great big balloon hanging off with a, a steel cable to it, and they, they on the side they threw the side over the sides these, these nets, these big, the ropes were probably two inches across. They were all woven. You could climb down into the Higgins boat, and the Higgins boat was here, and the, the bob, bobbing like a cork in the, in the tub, and uh, that was one of the things that uh, was scary to, to step down, and you think you're going to. Beyond Cetera firmer and it disappeared. But that happened to a lot of us. We, there were only about 18 to 20 guys in a, a Higgins boat. Uh, to look around and see, and it, all you could see were these Higgins boats. And um, there were some aircraft above us. I don't know what they were doing. 
uh, the, the Navy was still firing right, firing uh, artillery into the to the to the above the beach line. So it was a it was a you didn't have a time of being afraid. We're always afraid. Uh, I can't imagine um, anyone not being afraid. Uh, but we did. Well, this is it. You know, we're going to be on. You know, we're going to land. That that was the only thought I had. Was to survive. Hopefully, to get off the beach, which we did. You were not armed. No, sir. You're still a medic, so you're you're waiting to uh, go ashore and pick up the casualties, as you had done in Italy. So you're now a, a very uh, you're a veteran. Yeah. An experienced veteran. Yeah. Tell us about running into what what did you find on the beach and. How far in do, uh, did you go that day? We were, fortunately, we, uh, we met very little resistance. The most of the people who were defending that beach were, uh, were constricted from Poland and, and Czechoslovakia and, and countries that Hitler had overrun and made them, made them part of their Wehrmacht. Um, it wasn't until we, we, we were able to move in, inland uh, probably two or three miles. Before we really met some, you know, really is a resistance from. Mm -hmm. uh, what a difference the, from Anzio. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. Because uh, these people were were constrictors, and they they could care less about killing Americans. They were they were hoping they were rallying for us. I'm sure. Um, but not to say that the Germans didn't ca cause a lot of uh, problems for us, and, and we lost a lot of people there. Um, but it wasn't as, it wasn't a Normandy such or an Anzio type thing or Casablanca or Vidala or in Sicily or something. It's just a, it was a, it was a beachhead, and I'm glad I, it was the last one I was going to participate in. And did you keep pushing in then? Uh, we would kiss. Yes, we did. You, you uh, moved pretty rapidly went through, inland. We went up through uh, San Lier. Uh, I can't remember all the towns. Uh, Monte Lamar. Uh, Finally went to Nancy and then to Strasbourg, and we took Strasbourg. Um, we went to the Belfort Gap first. Excuse me, that was a big, big campaign because nobody, and this was in the Vosges Mountains. Nobody had ever, in the history of, of warfare, had ever had taken the the Belfort Gap and and gone through the Vosges Mountains uh, as successfully as we had. And it took us a long time. It took us the 15th of August until. Uh, until uh, that November to move that far. We weren't making any very good, very headway. Um, and we went to, got to Stra Strasbourg, uh, and we, we took Strasbourg and they th put us down in the Colmar pocket, which we stayed in that winter. Mine we were still on, in combat all this time. This is the 15th of August. We pulled off the lines and, and, uh, and, uh, we, were, and we were all part of the French First Army all this time, too. Uh, which is, uh, we had Gurkha troops with us, and which were part of, the, from, I guess, they were out of Morocco. Uh, but anyway, they were, they were probably French held territories. Um, we pulled out the lines in January of 1945, and that was the first relief we'd had uh, from, uh, we were 180 days in, on the line. Geographically, in, in January, where were you in relation to Bastogne and the Battle of the Bulge? We were about as far away as you could possibly be because we were on the other end of that line. We were on Colmar, which is down near uh, the southern part of Alsace-Lorraine, which is no more Alsace-Lorraine. Um, Switzerland. Um, that was France came around the bottom, but there. Uh, then Bastogne, and they were, they were way up north of us. And we would, you know, we didn't have any contact with any of those. The only thing we, every once in a while, we got our stars and stripes, and uh, we all looked for Bill Marlowe's cartoon first of all for a few hours. Joe and Willie. <laughs> yeah, and th th they'd say that you know, the, the Bastogne was going on, uh, San Lo, whatever those towns were up there. I forget now, uh, but that was a, that was something that we had our own thing to do. And uh, it was nice to know that someone else was helping out along the way, distracting the, the, the enemy, as it were. So you were on the eastern side of everything. If you were going across Europe, yeah, we were in the southern part of the whole deal, and they were yeah. up north. 
Okay. Yep. Did you, you finally cut off the line? We pulled up in uh, Saint Marie uh, in January, late January, maybe mid January of 1945. And uh, they said, well, you know, we're going to, you, you, and you will take, we had three day leaves of R&R. &R, and the first time we got to end up was in southern France someplace. Um, of course, it was snowing in the end of the winter. And I had to be the last guy on the weapons carrier. And my, when I got down, they had to lift me out. I was still in a city position. My whole side of my uniform was all caked with ice. And uh, but anyway, the first thing they did was they put DT down, DTT down our sleeves and up our pant legs and whatever to delouse us. Um, that was a standard operating procedure. I don't know what DTT. I understand later on was a was a. Uh, no, being deloused uh, <laughs> is part of. Coming in off the line, That's I would right, imagine. Yeah, it was. Did you get new no uniforms, fresh, we got, fresh gear? Yes, we got fr fresh uniforms and uh, and uh, uh, hot meals. And, uh, it was just a kind of a mirage. We were there three days. I don't know. I think I slept most of the time, uh, and there was nothing. You know, it was, wasn't a, a, a uh, any place you could. Taking a CYO show or something like that, or whatever they call me. The USO. USO. Coming to visit. CYO, yeah. USO. Here's Bob yeah. Hope and his they, crew. That was USO. Yeah. We never ran across any of that stuff. You have a minute now to stop and think about. You're off the line. You're alive. You've seen a lot of stuff. What about contact with home? Uh, were you getting mail? Were you sending mail? Yes, uh, I, uh, we had those little uh, airmail things that are not airmail, but there were v -mail. It, 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 uh, it wasn't email either. I think v -mail. what they called them in those days. But there was, you could write notes. I, I kept writing. Of course, you couldn't say anything where you were, or what was happening, or anything else. Uh, what the, you know, what area you were in. Uh, it was my box was E T O three, and that was the, my return address. But yes, we, we were picking up mail, and, uh, and of course, uh, my parents were really worried about me because I had not really been hit once, and uh, uh, they were af afraid that I, you know, I would uh, I would be killed, uh, which is a natural phenomenon. If I was an infantry division, that was pretty much a given that you were taking a chance every day. And, I think but I did appreciate the fact that I was still alive, and I felt very very sorry for the people who didn't make it. Is it part of the process, and maybe you can tell us, that when you're wounded, badly as you were, your family's advised, somebody, uh, the War Department uh, sends a telegram or something. So your folks got that back in Newton, didn't they? They first got the word that I was, they, thought they lost my medical records for some reason or other, and uh, I was missing in action. And a week later, they came back an officer came back, an army officer came back and said that I had been wounded. Did somebody literally come to your house? I think that mother, my mother said, yeah, when I was missing in action, so I came, I think she got a telegram this yeah. when, when I was, they found that I was wounded and I was back in, back with my company. So she, at least they knew you were alive and you were back on the line again as you were. That's right, yeah. Tell us what uh, what you do after this glorious three days in France. We uh, we went north to to uh, toward Nancy and uh, and uh, a couple of other towns. We went to and we went up. To, we were going back into combat now. Uh, we met some resistance up through the uh, Maginot Line. Uh, and we were, what we were going for, we were heading for the Rhine River. And uh, we actually saw emplacement from World War I from the Marginal Line, and then we got over the, across the Rhine. Was, the, the Siegfried Line was still remnants of that there, which we had to break down some of so our tanks could get through. We crossed the, the Rhine River as Weibrucken, and we were on going on to Nuremberg. About this time, the 3rd Armored Division, led by General Pat, George Patton, had gone through Nuremberg and came back with our, to our people and said that uh, reconnaissance, that everything's clear here, come ahead. So we went 
up to Nuremberg, and we had the, one of the worst battles of the war. Uh, Did you go through Munich first, or uh, no? No, that was, that was, no, no. We were doing that. We were up north. We went as far north as we could get from Nancy, and no, we were survived broken. Zweibrook and we came south into, to, to Nuremberg. Okay. And uh, they slaughtered us. You know, if I were the infantry guys, I would have done the same thing. If I saw a, a column of armored tanks coming along, I don't think I'd throw fire, fire rifles at them. They just went breezing right through. And of course, we came along with our infantry and, and uh, they nailed us. They had a lot of artillery power and everything else. And, uh, and that was a deterrent there. And then uh, we we weren't part of the Audubon. This is an interesting thing, and I've never read anything about it before. But um, as far as the eye can see, the Audubon was had a green strip down the middle of it. It was painted, so from above, I'm sure it must have looked like a you know like a divided highway. On either side, as far as you could see, as far as you could drive, there were there were bombers and fighter planes. And they couldn't use them because they had no, no gas, no fuel. They had bombed those Pawesi oil fields earlier on, and they had stripped them. They had plenty of planes. If they had a, a fuel for those planes, that war would have been lost, lost a lot longer. Uh, one of the tragedies of, of, of catching up with these people now, uh, we went across our first concentration camp. Just stop for a second. Um, these are German planes. All German planes, and they were abandoned there by the Germans they were for just lack parked of there fuel. Because they didn't have any fuel. Out on the autobahn, the sides of the autobahn. You'll be using that for a landing strip. Ah. So you're now up in the area of Germany that's part of Bavaria. Not quite. Northern. We're northern uh, down, we, we, we weren't in the Munich yet. Uh, which is Munich was just south of uh, as Nuremberg, as I remember. Things were happening awfully fast because we did run into, and I can't remember now whether it was that was uh, Buchenwald or whether it was Auschwitz, um, with the concentration camps for the with murdering the Jews. Uh, it was a very uh, emotional uh, thing to run across. The uh, I guess the 45th Division had been in, uh, and, uh, were, and they asked the medical battalion to go in. They saw what we could do to help, and uh, the people weren't just emaciated. As far as you can see, were, there were flat cars and box cars. Of, of emaciated people. And these rail cars were taking them and dump, dumping them in big pits and pouring lime on them. Uh, we went down to Munich and, uh, and just outside of Salzburg, we were steered again into another concentration camp and, and, uh, and uh, that was uh, Dachau. And there again, people, the wives of the, of the soldiers there said, we didn't know what was going on. Yet in their apartments in these lampshades that were human skin, with the, with the, these people who had died, they'd take the skin with the numbers on them and made lampshades. And, uh, I, it was the most inhumane act I've ever seen against a human. And, uh, these guys sit there day in and day out. They put the people in for showers, for instance. They turn gas with them where the water was supposed to come from. Uh, the most hideous things they did. Uh, and of course, we only, and these, these people, these emaciated, still, you call them still human, kill these guards with their bare hands and kill their, their attack dogs with their bare hands. And so, oh, you know, the, the, the human mind was something that was. Uh, but these guys did that uh, again. I just, uh, it makes me very emotional. Too. Prior to your actually witnessing these things with your own eyes, as a guy in the field moving along with an army, did you hear anything about this? Was there a rumor about these camps? None whatsoever. We smelled them before we got, yeah. you know, got into the and uh, and people said they didn't know what was going on. But we went, we 
we left the, we had hospital units that went in and took care of these people, thank God. As a medical man, did you go into camps and uh, service these people? There wasn't much we could do. We, we gave some of them plasma, and that, they were starved. They wanted to eat, and of course, we, all we had were sea rations, which was nothing but macaroni um, and uh, hash and stuff like that that was, you know, that, 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 and the person that starved to death, you had to slowly give them liquids and then solids and, and soft foods first. And, and we didn't, we weren't equipped with that. But thank God we had field hospitals that moved, units that moved in and, and took care of them. And then we went from, from we went to Salzburg and Salzburg into, into uh, Birch's Garden. And uh, tell us about going there. Birch's Garden is a beautiful little German town. That's right. But the German army happened to give Adolf Hitler a birthday present called his Eagle's Nest, which That's is right. up there. That's Did right. you go up in his elevator? We, that was hun that whole that mountain was honeycomb. Yeah. It was seven stories down. They had a hospital in it, school. They had uh, barracks. They had movie theaters. They, it was actually amazing. And his house was still on fire when we got there. And I try to get the door knocker off his front door, which I let the pound on my flesh of us. It was so hot. It was good. Uh, but I did, uh, we, we did see all this, uh, yes. That we had a tough time getting up there. Our engineers had to build a, uh, a road part. They blew part of the road off. They jerry meant, they rigged a, jerry rigged a, a roadway, and we went up into the, the Bursch's garden. And uh, that was quite an amazing thing. Hitler's house had a massive fireplace in it with a green stone along the top. Are your initials carved in that? I don't believe so. I, don't, I, <laughs> I saw it. I, as I remember vaguely now uh, things that, was, that were happening pretty fast. I did have a handful of his towels that he used out of his bathroom. But, did you really? Uh, hand towels, yeah. Have you still got them? Yes, sir. Have yeah. you really? Yeah. 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 Isn't the view superb? <laughs> I haven't used them either. You know. They were all they're so iron the way they were the day I found them. But when then we came back off the off that mountain, off the mountain and we garrisoned Salzburg, oh, for a, a top of two or three weeks, and the Salzburg Salzburg Symphony Orchestra uh, gave performances for us almost every single day. Yeah, well, that's yeah. Mozart's hometown. Just, yeah, yeah, it was just a, you know it was just something that uh, that. So a lot of the kids that I was with never was exposed to anything but, but uh, swing music and, and country music. Uh, so it was quite a, a, a thing for them to, to witness. Is it true, uh, in, in, my, in my sense of where you are now, that uh, the war is just about over or we're getting close to it? Are you into the spring a, of 45? That's right. That's and right. you're in I, Salzburg, which is a, a beautiful place to be. That's right. The cessation was then, was, the war was over as far as that was concerned. And Salzburg is Austria, and the Austrians fought on the German side. That's right. Did you find a difference in the people there? Yeah. Uh, right down the road is the German border. Uh, yeah. Was there a difference in the people you met? Yes. I, so, let me put this. We were not a, you know, it was a fraternized, first of all. And a lot of these women were asked to do our laundry and you know, stuff like that. We paid them you know, candy bars and stuff like that. We didn't have any money, per se. Uh, once we got into Germany, the German, the Wehrmacht, was mostly in charge then. Uh, the SS troopers were trying to bail out and get away as, fast, as far as they could. Uh, the resistance wasn't as severe where the SS troopers were. The Wehrmacht didn't want their homeland destroyed which was the People's Army of Wehrmacht. Uh, in, in Austria, the people were, they were reluctantly constricted into the German army. Um, as you remember, the sound of music and whatever, the resistance for those people who were in the army and didn't, didn't, really didn't want, as far as I was concerned, didn't want any part of it. Um, but uh, in Bavaria, it was the same way. Uh, it's a, but I have, I have a feeling that they were they were more peaceful people, if you will. It just it seemed that, you know, their, their gesture of, of having this Salzburg, Salzburg Symphony play for us while we're there and whatever. It was, uh, 
So, but our job then uh, turned around to taking care of people who had been on automobile accidents and stuff like that. And we moved from Salzburg into Frankfurt, where the third division headquarters was, and uh, and uh, we took over a town called Bedwildungen, and uh, of course it was a it was a bath town where they went for cures and whatever, and we took over a small hot uh, hot uh, hospital there. Uh, there were spas there. Yeah, yeah baths. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and these people were the soldiers in these these ho hospitals all around there. They saw we were the third infantry division. They didn't want they didn't want to come out of the hospitals. They were afraid of us, and. Uh, uh, yeah. We were in the in the few in the time I was with my division, it turned over five and a half times. It was over eight thousand people who were going through the division, by the wounded or killed. What so, were you and doing? We were pretty, you know, yeah. we were pretty severe with the Germans and, and the Nazis, especially. What were you doing specifically in Frankfurt? Were you at the the hospital there? We were at the Frank the division headquarters was in Frankfurt, and I I was in uh, at Bad Veldungen, uh, taking care of the sick calls from the regiments and whatever. Were you in the hospital? I was. The, we the were big, in the, the hospital situation. The, we had set up a, yeah. a, a hospital, and I said, "Hmm, we guys used to come in with with uh, venereal disease, and uh, they'd be sent back to Army and Corps, which is up three or we would lose the guys sometimes for a week or ten days." So. I had the bright idea that let's do it right here in the division, which I did. They made me essential for, for four months, and, and I had a, I had to stay there. And, and uh, uh, I set up stations all around Frankfurt, and and, uh, and we took care of these these guys that uh, that had you know, disease. That was a, uh, and then they wrote to me back. I came back. I went up to. Uh, I went up to. Uh, Bremen, Bremerhaven, and we came out of Bremerhaven. We came back to the 29th Division, who had, had invaded Normandy uh, the previous May. And that's, uh, came back and came back on a, on a ship in New York Harbor and with the Fort Dix. You sailed in into New Jersey. York Harbor? Fort, Fort, Fort Dix in 46. We always claimed we got there in 46. <laughs> so. uh, and then. Uh, Where were you discharged? Uh, we we were discharged in uh, in uh, Fort Devens. They sent us up in a troop train. Uh, it was discharged the 21st of January, 1944. 46. I mean 46. Uh, 46. At 44, Italy. Yeah. Let, let's let's look at that date just a second. It it was. January, January 46. Yeah, okay. And you were discharged. I was discharged, right. Yeah. Before combat um, and your experiences beginning in Italy, working up through France, Germany, um, what did you know about the enemy, the Germans? And I guess the secondary part of this is what did you think of them before and before or after combat? Well, the only thing we knew about Germans was Hitler. And we couldn't wait to annihilate, I guess, at that point in time, England was German. And as far as the German soldiers are concerned, they were out to get us and we were out to get them. We were trying to win our war and get rid of Hitler. And, uh, and I think that was the attitude of, of, of all of us. Uh, uh, after the war, these people were, you know, they were Caucasians. They were like us. Uh, uh, I see now, you know, the same thing is coming about again with these, these skinheads and and the people who said there wasn't any Holocaust and uh, and people things like that. Uh, it, it seems to me that the Germans were susceptible to a lot of rabble rousing and, and uh, uh, getting their emotions stirred up to to uh, to be, you know. Yeah, I said before, Deutschland over alles, uh, Deutschland over all, and uh, we used to, t as I say, to tell the German prisoners, said, and then unter America über Deutschland, and uh, that would make them not very upset. But you know, it's. Uh, Was there a most 
memorable experience in your career that uh, you you saw a lot? You you started in Casablanca and went all the way through. Is there something that stands out in your mind more than anything else there? One of the most weird things when after I when I got hit, I had a feeling that I was outside my body and I was looking down and I'm there and I don't I want to get back and I and I, I don't know what period of time that was. But that was a, a really weird experience. Uh, uh, I guess uh, the, the, you know, the combat itself was something that, that, that nobody's ever prepared for. Um, and the killing and everything else that goes with it, uh, I hope that everyone's learned, someone's learned a lesson from it. Obviously, we have, we've had a career, and we've had a Vietnam too, so. Um, those were other wars. How about a character, a person that you think about? Uh, somebody you met, somebody you lost, whatever. It's the fellow, he's kind of a, my mentor, he's a lot older than I was, uh, Charlie O'Donnell. He was from Sioux City, Iowa. And uh, Charlie kind of was my, well, he was in this. In his 30s, I was 19 years old, so he was an old man as far as I was concerned. And uh, he did a lot in helping me uh, acclimate myself and you know, to ignore some, some things and to how to more or less survive. And uh, uh, I kept in touch with him after he went home early because he had been in every campaign from the lands in North Africa, Sicily, Italy, all the way through to, to, uh, to France. And uh, he went home in January. Uh, we had pulled off the lines, they sent him back. Uh, but he had been all that combat all the time, and he, uh, he was quite a guy. And, uh, he, uh, I kept track of him, and uh, finally I, his wife wrote me back one day that he had died. And I didn't know him, but he was a great guy. Evidently that you should uh, yeah. have remembered him. Yeah. It's, it's almost hard to ask this, but uh, after all you've been through, but was there a, a humorous experience you can remember? Probably looking back on it, the most humorous thing I probably ever did was to, when I was at the recruit, when I was at the desk at the, at the uh, corporal at the Fort Devens, they wanted to know um, what I would like to do. And I, whenever I get the words out of my mouth, as long as I'm outdoors, I'll be all right. That was, I think, probably the Probably the most humorous thing that ever happened. <laughs> they took you at your word. <laughs> they took me at my word, right? Yeah. It's <laughs> you may want to rethink that next time you're trapped. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> no, no volunteering, either. <laughs> you told us where you were discharged. Can you tell us with what rank and decorations? Yes. I was a, I was a, a, a surgical technician, a sergeant, for a fourth class, T4. Um, I had uh, received the uh, Purple Heart, a Good didn't, Conduct Medal. Didn't you have three Purple Hearts? Well, no, I was only had one Purple. As far as my parents knew, that I only had to get hit once. And, uh, but I did have a couple of flesh wounds after that, and I, I said, you know, forget about it. It's, uh, but I did, have, I did receive two of them, and, uh, uh, and then I had a I had uh, the uh, European Afro American Afro uh, uh, African campaign, uh, uh, Mediterranean European African campaign, uh, with seven several battle, seven battle stars and a and an arrowhead for a beach Atlantic, which was a, was the fifteenth of August in nineteen forty four, um, and then I had the uh, I had the victory medal and the Army of Occupation. I was later. Uh, wore the American Theater ribbon, and uh, he also had the foigere, which is a rope around the shoulder, and the croix de guerre, uh, which was issued to us for our for our duty with the French First Army in the southern southern when we went to southern France the 15th of August of January the 45. That was a that was a recognition of our efforts uh, for the French. Was that an, un an unusual decoration? For an American soldier, I to understand have it was. I, I, I never, never pursued it. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, uh, to this day, I've never seen, I never given a quarter gear. I, um, I thought about it a couple of times, but then again, I was supposed to be given a bronze star too, but I, I wasn't, so I didn't pursue that either. 
you, you were awarded that but never received it. Is that the Croix de Guerre? The Croix de Guerre. No, I, just, I never saw it. No. Well, we, it's too late to write to Charles de Gaulle. But <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Did you join any reserve unit when you came home? Anything um, like that? As a matter of fact, uh, no, I did not. I, I don't think that when the guy asked me if I re up for the American Theater Ribbon, I, I don't think I could have gotten in the Salvation Army then because uh, I spent, after I got out of service, I spent uh, time at Brighton Marine Hospital. I spent over a year up at Cushing uh, trying to solve my problems with my, my leg where I was wounded. Service related wounds? and Oh, yeah, that was yeah. a long time. I have Now I have a total knee replacement that's a result of that. Uh, uh, my, they were going to, they wanted to do a subathectomy on my leg, which was means of cutting the nerve from my spine to my leg. And I said, what happens? And he said, well, well we can, with a brace you can carry it, you can drag it around. And I said, I don't think so. And I went over the hill and a friend of mine's father had a farm up in New Hampshire, Washington, New Hampshire. And I, I went up there and he put me on a cleat track tractor and a mowing machine and a, and a hay rake and everything else with my right leg. And it built my muscles, my leg up, so it wasn't atrophied anymore. I came back to Kishi Cushing, they discharged me, and, uh, and uh, unfortunately, they, while I was in the hospital, the, the, uh, my contact with the VA said that, you know, you don't have to pay your premium while you're in the hospital, but you have to pay two of them when you come out. So I paid two of them when I came out, but they took my insurance away from me because they, I should have been paying it all along. I've got the wrong information from the VA. But those things happened, and I fell well, out. Like for that time, I had rated insurance and health insurance, life insurance. So uh, that those were the, that's what that my experience was at the hospital and I. So you got some bum advice. Yeah. Hmm? You got some poor advice. Yes, yeah. I did. I did, no question about it. And that's, you know, it's hindsight's 2020. It's, uh, but I feel as if I've been, been acclimated and was one of the things that was kind of humorous too. The, on, on board ship coming back, they passed those pamphlets to everyone. Said, this, this is what life is in the civilian, well, yeah, as a civilian. And they told you words you couldn't use anymore in, in the, the everyday use and whatever. <laughs> Bob laughed, I'm sure he had the same thing <laughs> coming back from the Marine Zone. But uh, it was. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> How were you received when you came home? Uh, this is 1946. Did you get a good reception? Uh, yes, I, I read about the receptions of so people coming back from Europe, and uh, uh, we had some Red Cross workers uh, meet us in, uh, at the, at the point, of, point of embarkation in, uh, in New York City, and, uh, and uh, I must say the people there cheering us and whatever, it was very nice. How important to you, Charles, was serving in the military? Well, it's something I don't think I would have done unless there was a war on. Um, I think it, took, it, it, it actually helped me learn about different cultures because we had people in our organization that couldn't write and they couldn't read. I used to write letters from some of these fellows. And, uh, I knew the value of an education. I wanted to get an education when I came home. Um, and I, it's a, I, I guess I wouldn't have been prepared to be as accepting of others, uh, whether by their color of their skin or their, their religious uh, uh, choices. Uh, those things, I, I became, I think, more rounded. It's a, you know, if you will, it's a, after all that stuff, I, I've tried to forget about the, the horrors of the whole thing and, and uh, get on with my life, and I think I have. I, I, uh, I try to be a good citizen and uh, have a wonderful family and, and uh, uh, I was able to serve a, my community, uh, uh, the youth commission, and the, on the youth commission and town meeting member for 38 years. I was in the last, I was in the went full cycle, I went on the, on the council on aging, so it's, uh, but uh, it did, it, I think it, if it asked a specific question, yeah, it did help me. Uh, to be more accepting of others. What, what did you think then, and what did you think now about the war you were involved in? 
did you at any point have a change of heart or mind about the objectives that caused you to enlist? None whatsoever. Never looked back once. No. No, I think that we did it was the right thing. Um, and uh, circumstances uh, happened that you had no control over and sometimes, and I think that's, those happen in wartime and, and uh, they are unfortunate, but I'm not putting any fingers on anyone. I don't think anyone else should either. You spoke about a moment ago about uh, the reception you got when you got yeah. uh, home. Uh, do, do you feel there was a difference um, in the way in public opinion regarding the reception veterans received when they came home from Korea and when they came home from Vietnam and when they came home from your war? I don't, to, to me, having been in my situation, I felt a lot of empathy for the people who were in the Korean War and the Vietnam War. That was a different situation too. And we were, in the, in, in the war in the Pacific was a lot different from what we were fighting. In, you know, we were fighting Caucasians and we, it, which is a different different type of thing. These had, uh, had maybe their middle attitude is a lot different. But I, I sympathize with the people in, in the Korean situation. Uh, as a matter of fact, my younger brother evacuated my old outfit out of Pusan in Korea. He was a, he was called back in the Navy as a, an, armed, an armed guard, and whatever. But he, you know, that war it was a war. Vietnam was a war. It was a horrible thing and. And these people were sniping at you all the time. It was a different. It was different terrain. It was different. A lot of things. The Pacific was a, a lot different terrain to battle and to fight on than we were in Europe. We had you know hills and mountains and and uh, green fields and whatever. Uh, not all friendly all the time, but uh, from what I've heard, and that friend of mine was in the, in the, in the Marines in the Pacific, in Okinawa and, and Iwo Jima. He was a forward observer. Uh, they were different. It was different, sir. Different people. And I think those Korean and and, and Vietnam War veterans are entitled to anything that the the uh, and recognition that the people in World War One and World War Two were. Did you uh, take advantage of any of uh, the uh, uh, veterans' benefits, such as uh, other than hospitalization? Did you use the GI Bill? Uh, of course. Did you go? Yeah. Tell us about you went to school after I you got to, out of the service. Right. Yep. I went to school uh, and uh, I went two years at junior college at Newton. Um, and then uh, then I went to, I had been accepted to go to Colby. And then I hadn't cleared the, the VA with the hospitalization. So they recommended I at least start junior college and I could transfer, which I, which I, which I intended to do. But I wound up at Babson. And uh, I graduated from Babs in 19, class 1952, and uh, and that was a that was a great experience. It's, uh, I also, in, at the end of my my sophomore sophomore year of uh, college, my dad died, and my brother Joe and I bought a house in in uh, Wellesley uh, Wellesley Farms on the GI Bill, and. Uh, we use I use half it. He used half his. He's still in the house, and uh, I used part of mine to to uh, buy a house in Wellesley in 19 uh, around 50, 56, 57. Well, good for you. Is there one thought, one other thing that uh, you would like to share uh, with your family or people who will watch this tape in the future? that you want to get on the record? Well, you know, one, th one thing that, that, uh, that sticks in my mind, and, and uh, it's uh, one thing I'd like to leave is that, you know, this world doesn't know anyone are living. This country doesn't, that we live in. Everyone should, you know, appreciate what they're exposed to. In education, I recommend to every young person that ever sees this to do the best they can in school. Listen to their teachers, pursue whatever, whether academics or auto mechanics or whatever, but always do the best possible job you can. 
And I think if people and, and love thy neighbor as thyself is something that I think is a is something that everyone the creeds that you should live by and uh, be respectful for others. It's uh, something that I've always tried to do, treat everyone fair and square. Charles Fagan, thank you for coming in today. Well, it's my pleasure. We appreciate it. Thank you very much for your patience. I appreciate it.